Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this AHDB webinar where we will be discussing recent advances in our understanding of contagious ovine digital dermatitis, CODD. My name is Chloe McKee, and I'm a Knowledge Transfer Manager for Beef and Lamb. And our speaker this evening is Dr. Jennifer Duncan, Senior Lecturer in Livestock Health and Welfare at the University of Liverpool. And we are also joined by my colleague, Liz King, Animal Health and Welfare Scientist at AHDB. The plan of action this evening is that Jennifer will take us through a 35 minute presentation and then we'll move on to questions at the end. You can type in your questions at any time throughout the webinar or will be anonymous and I'll read these out to Jennifer after the presentation. So if you can't see your questions box, please click on the orange arrow to open up the control panel and click on the questions drop down and you'll see where you can type your question in. As usual, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Beef and Lamb YouTube channel in the next couple of days. If you're having any technical problems, please also use this questions box to let me know and I'll do my best to help. The usual advice is to log out and come back in. And for those of you listening this evening that are eligible for Rosa points for your attendance, please type in your membership number into the questions box as well. So Jennifer, without further delay, I will hand over to you to uh, introduce yourself and begin the presentation. Hi, thank you, Chloe. And hello, everyone. And thank you for um, inviting me to talk this evening. So my name is Jennifer Duncan and I'm a vet and a researcher from Liverpool Vet School. Um, my team, kind of all these bods here, um, have been researching um, contagious ovine digital dermatitis for the past few years. And um, the aim of this evening is to share with you our current scientific evidence that we've gathered on COD that hopefully you will be able to apply to your practical on-farm situations. Um, some of the areas of, of knowledge on COD, are, we have quite good knowledge, other, other areas not so much. So I don't have all the answers on CODD, but at the end I will try and address um, as, as many questions as we can at the end. So please feel free um, to, to, to type in some questions. Okay, so we'll get started. So in this talk this evening, um, I'm going to discuss some of our research highlights at Liverpool and how you can translate those into your farming practice. I will discuss what causes COD, how we currently diagnose it, our best current advice for treatment and controlling CODD as well. So hopefully the sort of things that you are keen to know about. So the work presented here is um, by no means all down to me. I've managed to rope quite a few of fellow staff members at Liverpool Vet School to come and work with me on COD. So we've had sort of pathology people here. We've had sort of epidemiologists, sort of my, various microbiologists and um, immunologists and um, vets and, 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 and farmers as well. So some vets helping with some field work. So this represents a lot of people's work here. Um, we can't do any research without funding and HDB and HCC have been really strong supporters of us, as have the veterinary profession and um, through the Animal Welfare Foundation. And thanks to the support of HDB and Habuki, we have also managed to get some central government funding as well. So thank you very much to all of you and um, the levy pairs for that. And hopefully we'll be um, repaying that with, with some good knowledge and information tonight. Um, I also, um, a lot of vets and farmers have worked really closely with us. We aim for our work to be very practical solutions for farmers and many farmers have helped us by letting study us uh, study their sheep, filling in our surveys and sharing uh, with us their own ideas, their own experience. Um, because that can be absolutely invaluable. So many thanks to all of you um, out there who've helped us with that. Um, so anyway, before I was writing this last night, I thought it's starting to sound a bit like an, an acceptance speech for an Oscar. So um, I should maybe get on with the talk now. So, um, so what is um, contagious ovine digital dermatitis? Well, it's a, it's a severe infectious foot disease which typically presents as a red sore area um, up near the junction of the horn and the skin. They are known as the coronary band. 
then what happens is this inflammatory lesion um, progresses down the inside of the hoof capsule, gradually pushing the hoof capsule off which you can see here, the hoof capsule is gradually coming away until eventually the hoof capsule um, completely is, uh, falls off. Um, as the foot starts to heal and they do get better from this disease, which is great news from a sheep and everyone's point of view, um, the, um, the, 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 the surface of the horn sort of grows a fresh covering and, and starts to harden. In this one here, we've still got some active inflammation, active infection, but it gradually will re-harden and grow fresh horn, but often they end up um, a little bit deformed and stumpy as well. So often they don't look great um, afterwards. Um, to help you um, sort of, you know, differentiate between sort of other common foot diseases that you might see on your farm, um, I'm sure this is familiar to many of you, but just so you can compare the three different ones. When we talk about scald or instigital dermatitis or benign foot rot, different people call it different things, so I'll use all three names. We're really looking at a red area with perhaps some white scummy material um, in the interdigital space. Whereas foot rot um, is when we have um, the scald lesion, so that scald lesion would be the interstitial space, but we have um, separation of the horn, so the horn starts to become separated and eroded, um, and that process, it kind of, you can see the kind of almost like circular pattern here across both um, halves of the claw and um, that sort of happens from the inside outwards so it travels in that direction whereas CODD as we said starts up here at the coronary band and we get a progressive inflammation um, going go, going southwards, um, as it were. And also, um, I know quite a few farmers who are probably connoisseurs of sheep's feet um, also report that they actually notice quite a different smell, you know, foot rot being quite sort of almost slightly cheesy smell with cod a more sort of slightly sweetish smell. Um, so I guess that might be something, maybe we can train some sniffer dogs or something to differentiate between the two. Um, but yes, yeah, to do with the different type of damage, this is because the horn's been eating away. And in this one, we've got separation of, of the tissue. So as with many things in life, um, it's not always as clear cut and that on farms. And we do often see mixed infections, which can be tricky to diagnose. And you're just not sure, is that cod? Is it foot rot? You know, what's, what's going, is it a foot abscess? What's going on here? So if you're, if you're in any doubt, my advice would be um, that you and your vet should try and look at, if you're trying to work out what are the main causes of lameness on your farm, get a bunch of lame sheep in and go through as many as you can to try and work out which diseases are present. And quite often, all three will be present and they'll be present in, in mixed in infections. So, you know, these are nice clear pictures that I've picked out, but I do appreciate it's not always as straightforward as that. And hopefully at some point in our research, we will um, come up with a, a, a more formal diagnostic test. That's one of the things we would like to do. At the moment, we're just relying on clinical appearance. So as we said, cod is a really severe cause of lameness, not just because of the loss of the hoof capsule here, which is obviously going to be extremely painful for the sheep and very painful to walk on, but the disease also causes damage to the bones inside the hoof. So we can see here that the bone is actually been eaten away. So it's sort of like the bacteria are actually destroying the bone inside the hoof. So um, and, and so that damage is, is really quite extensive, just emphasizing the severity of it. And indeed, on one of our on-farm studies, we measured the animal welfare impact of cod, and we examined lots of sheep with lots of different foot lesions. And then, so that's the different, we looked at cod sheep, we looked at interstitial dermatitis or scald sheep, sheep with foot rot, sheep with cod and interstitial dermatitis and cod and foot rot. And then we, we lamely scored them. 
and you can see that the, the cod sheep scored really high, much higher than the other two diseases on the lameness score. And when cod got involved with iodine foot rot, obviously their lameness went, went right up. And so if you have a mixture of both diseases, your sheep's in a bit of trouble there. So really, you know, we, we know it's got a serious welfare impact. We haven't really measured the economic impact, but it is, you know, likely to be as as bad, if not worse, than, than that what's quoted for foot rot. And unsurprisingly, um, you know, in the recent ruminant health and welfare um, industry survey, lameness is a top priority disease for the sheep industry to tackle. Um, and in particular, CODD. So um, we do appreciate that, you know, there are a lot of concerns about it and, you know, we, we, we're doing our best um, to try and tackle the disease and would be very happy to do more um, um, to, 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 to help with that. Um, so how common is COD? Well, um, it was first reported in 1997. So, um, you know, not you know, relatively recently compared to other uh, foot diseases. And then by 2003, in a survey that was done, about 6% of flocks were affected. Um, by 2014-16, we're looking at about half of flocks in England and Wales being affected by, by cod. And um, so really it has, you know, spread pretty extensively now with, within the UK. And recently, there's been reports of cod occurring in Germany, Sweden, and Ireland as well. So um, it's it's definitely you know continuing to spread. And also, if you if you have cod, then you're in good company. As I duly noted, as my son was watching Jeremy Clarkson uh, this summer, that um, he's the new poster boy of farming, as I understand it. He actually reported an outbreak of cod in his sheep flock. So, so it had even extended to to I think it's called Diddley Squat Farm. So, widespread and common. So one of the important areas of research that we've been working on over the past few years is um, what causes it. Um, and um, there's a number of bacteria involved in cod. Um, so one that we find a lot is these group of bacteria called the treponine bacteria. And they are very similar, potentially identical, but we haven't got that far with gene sequencing yet. Um, but to digital dermatitis in cattle. So, so far they look very similar, but we need to do more work on that to see if they are actually identical. So um, these treponine bacteria, they turn up all the time in cod feet. Um, and this is just a little picture of them here. They've been stained brown. And this is the horn of the hoof on the top. And this is the underlying sensitive tissue. And you can see in this, in this inflammatory material and right at the front of the lesion, the treponine bacteria are kind of all over the place. But also we find commonly in, in cod feet and um, Dicylobacter nidosis and Fusobacterium necrophorum. And you might be familiar with those, particularly Dicylobacter nidosis is the cause of um, foot rot in sheep. So that crops up pretty frequently as well. So um, we've also looked at um, what, um, as well as the bacteria which cause cod, we've also looked at the factors on farm that make cod more likely to occur. And these are important as understanding these can help us come up with better control plans for cod. So we found that if you've got a large block, then you're more likely to have cod. I'm not saying you maybe might necessarily want to do something about that, but you know we did, that's just a general observation, and that may well be due to sort of increased animal movement, perhaps. Um, lowland farms, we find it more commonly. That might be to do with um, sort of un, you know sort of stocking rates, more intensive conditions, so more sheep on there. Um, if sheep are on lush pasture, so um, often that means that the pasture is quite wet or if the pasture is very muddy, so as this sort of scenario here, where um, we get sort of a lot of mud around sort of feeding troughs, around gateways, um, it, th things like that. 
and um, that seems to increase the risk and um, but the biggest risk factor we found for cod was that if a sheep had previously had foot rot then they are much more likely to get cod so we've got this link already between seeing some of the bacteria in foot rot in cod lesions but also the sort of risk factors as well Another sort of um, risk factor area that we might might be familiar to some of you is we found a seasonal trend for cod. So in this graph here, we show that um, um, on the farms we studied that there was a peak of cod disease. So this is like months of the year, and this is the amount of cod on the farm. And we found that it was a peak of cod occurring really in the sort of autumn, late summer, autumn period, and then a slightly smaller peak sort of in, 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 the, in the late spring, early summer. You know, so we might, you, and, and this is important because this can help you sort of know if you when to get ahead of the game. So putting control points in here could prevent this peak occurring. We don't know why the autumn peak happens, but it could well be something to do with um, build up of bacteria on the pasture and um, warm wet weather is in, in the autumn is you know very good for bacterial growth um, and, and high stocking rates often you know in the autumn you've had a lot of sheep grazing over the summer as the lambs get bigger um, and so that the you know, warm wet conditions and high stocking rates may well be what's what's called what's um, triggering that that's what but we don't know that for sure so um, to, in quite a few of our studies, as I've mentioned, we have found strong links between cod and foot rot. And in our most recent experimental work, where we induced cod in a group of healthy house sheep, so we did that to follow um, the disease progression, it appears um, that um, the majority of cod lesions in this study developed in feet that had a previous um, sort of instigial dermatitis or, or foot rot lesion. So this seemed to be um, um, perhaps in causing some initial damage to the foot, and this seemed to be important for the cod lesions to, to go on to develop. Um, so um although, so we do need to repeat this work in the fields this was done in a, in certain conditions we do need to repeat this work in the field but it is consistent with our previous studies and our previous advice that an important very important factor for controlling CODD is controlling foot rot as well so that's really one of the key messages is controlling sort of both diseases together so um, now we need to come on to how we treat cod. Um, cod is a bacterial disease, so it needs to be treated with antibiotics. That's pretty straightforward. I know that there's concern about antibiotic use in farming because of you know antimicrobial resistance in the human population. However, um, it's fine to use antibiotics as long as we use them responsibly, because we've also got to balance, you know, antibiotic use and animal welfare. So it's a bacterial disease. We need to be treating it with antibiotics, um, which is fine. And we need to use them responsibly. So that means that we need to select the right drug, give the right dose and give the drug for the correct length of time so that the foot actually gets better. Um, so um, we've done some work to finding out about these things and we've done some work testing bacterial growth in the in the laboratory and we've done quite a lot of field studies on, on farms. Um, so we've got sort of reasonable evidence base on that. And so although I'm going to go talk about the different drugs and things like that that we use, um, obviously, it goes without saying, you know, you need to sort of work this through with your vet and come up with a plan specifically for you and your farm. So what we found is that two groups of antibiotics work particularly well against the um, against the foot rot bacteria, sorry, the cod bacteria. Um, and these are the penicillins and the macrolide group of antibiotics. In our field studies, we've used a sort of long acting version of amoxicillin, that's a penicillin type antibiotic, and that lasts about 48 hours. One dose gives about 48 hours protection. 
um, and we get reasonable cure rates sort of depending on how many doses of that we give we've got sort of we've had found between sort of 80 and 90 percent cure rates but what's what i really want to emphasize here is that very often one single dose of long-acting amoxicillin isn't enough to cure the foot so we need to make sure that they get the correct dose and an effective length of course of antibiotics and to put that in a little bit of perspective when um, humans get treated for these treponine bacteria um, they usually give them a course of antibiotics lasting between two and four weeks and um, not a single dose that lasts 48 hours so that just gives you a little bit of context so say you know this all this sort of advice goes out to the veterinary profession as well so vets should be able to advise on this so we need to plan your treatment strategy what's going to work best for you with your vet because there are various drugs out there various options dose rates and things like that so but importantly what you can do as a farmer is treat as soon as possible because obviously that's what you want from an animal welfare point of view but also you want to treat them the sooner you treat them the less damage it will do to the foot and the more quickly the sheep will get better so um, and then also it will reduce the infection burden on the farm so hopefully and um, reduce spread of disease and from that point of view also we would suggest it's a good idea to isolate them so bring them in put them in a pen if you can if that's possible or in a separate field somewhere they're very accessible and the other reason for that is when we're dosing so i'll come to that bit next yeah the other thing we say is you know know what weight your animals are you know make sure you agree with your vet what the dose is you're going to use you know don't underdose that's never going to be helpful and say you know one option that we've done is we've treated with long acting amoxicillin and we've given a dose every two days until the foot is healed so this is an example of a healed foot you know there's no active red bits on there it's all dried up and the horn is regrowing um, so, so treat every two days until the foot is healed. And that could mean you might need to do two doses, it might need three doses, it might need four doses. Like I say, remember the human, they were having it for a month. So I'm not suggesting we probably need to do a month, but you know, they need multiple doses. Also discuss with your vet um, giving them pain relief because obviously it's a very painful condition, you know, being in such pain could affect the use eating, it could affect your ability, say, for example, to look after a lamb, or if it's lambs that are affected, you know, um, lamb growth as well. So, so consider using pain relief. And if it's not responding and if it's not working, then talk to your vet because in my experience, cod is very treatable and you should be able to get your sheep better um, with that uh, rather than end up with a sort of chronically lame sheep so um always get asked about foot trimming and cod and um, we've not sort of done any specific studies on whether foot trimming um delays healing like has been done with foot rot but what we would say is that the treponine bacteria are found on the on the clippers and the um, gloves after handling cod sheep. So if you're trimming that foot, the, the bugs are going to be all over your hands and all over there. And you go to the next sheep and you're going to just pass that infection on. So create really important risk of spreading infection. So we've got no evidence that hoof trimming helps at all. So largely we would say avoid hoof trimming cod sheep just as you're advised to do with foot rot as well. So when you've got active infection, just treat the infection. That really would be important. So finally, um, in the in the last section, just going to talk to you about controlling cod um, at the flock level. So talked about individual treatment, but what to do at the flock level. So you wouldn't think I was a vet, would you? Because I start every slide with a plan with your vet, <laughs> trying to get us some work really here. But anyway, no, I think it is really important that it is planned. You know, you've got a plan for how you're going to deal with this, how you're going to tackle it, how you're going to get on top of the situation. And particularly, say, the diagnosis can sometimes not be straightforward. So it's good to have a have a couple of you look through and 
you know, decide what diseases you've got present, look at what risk factors might be important in your farm, what things might be contributing to disease occurrence, to work out what your treatment plan is, and then see what of the following control options might be that I'm going to discuss now might be appropriate for you. So, you know, just as we said, prompt, second thing is just treat them quickly. You know, prompt antibiotic treatment, treat until the foot is healed, isolate and avoid trimming. And as we said, that will help the feet get better more quickly and there'll be less disease around and less spread of disease as well and better for welfare. So that's the same advice as you get for foot rot, prompt antibiotic treatment. Then improve the hygiene if possible, wherever you can. You know, if there's problems in field areas, is there, you know, where it's wet, where it's muddy, where you think there might be a buildup of infection um, on the ground here. So, um, you know, is there anything or gateways? Is there anything possibly that you might be able to do uh, that way? Again, the handling areas could potentially be a source of infection. So, you know, keeping those sort of clean and dry. And I think that's the thing, that's what we've found is, is that dry is, is really important, you know, particularly so when you're in the house, when the sheep are housed, you know, trying to keep that bedding as dry as possible um, and, and clean, um, that, that, that should really help sort of keep the bacterial load down and also, um, you know, prevent damage to the foot, which then can allow the bacteria in. So trying to do whatever you can to improve underfoot hygiene. Um, you know, if you're handling um, feet, um, you know, then we um, find that, um, say, we don't advise trimming, but if you're handling feet, then, and you don't want to spread it from sheep to sheep, then we have done some studies showing um, different antibacterial um, soap, ethanol, FAM30, which is a disinfectant I'm sure many of you might have on your farms, or Burkon. We tested all these products and they were all capable of killing the treponine bacteria. So we can use those to help improve hygiene on the farm. And then control foot rot, as I mentioned many times in the study, you know, there's a lot of strong evidence linking these two diseases and that many cod lesions actually arise from either a scald or a foot rot lesion. So um, I'm sure you've heard, or a lot of you will heard about the five point plan for controlling foot rot. And fortunately, there's a huge overlap here from controlling cod. So we know we've got the prompt treatment, we've got the farm hygiene. And interestingly, um, there's um there's um there's overlap with foot with the foot rot vaccine, foot vax. So not every farm with foot rot will vaccinate, but if you are struggling struggling to keep on top of foot rot, it's well worth considering this as an option. So um We've done some studies um, looking at the effectiveness of the foot rot vaccine. And interestingly, um, the foot rot vaccine, in the, this was on farm studies we did, um, had a, an efficacy of 32%. So it, sheep that were vaccinated, they, there was a third less cases of cod in the vaccinated sheep compared to the unvaccinated sheep. And then for foot rot, there was two thirds pretty much less foot rot in the vaccinated sheep compared to the unvaccinated sheep. So, and if you compare that, say, to sort of like COVID vaccine efficacy, I think the, the AstraZeneca one's about 91% or something like that against hospitalization. That's not too bad at all, really. So, um, foot vax can be really helpful to control foot rot. We need to control foot rot to co control cod. But I think it's important to emphasize it's not 100%. No vaccine is, you know, the, the, say the AstraZeneca vaccine is not 100%. We all know that. And we need to use other measures as well, you know, that, that we've already talked about. But it can certainly be a, a, a good help. And so, um, again, but you've got to follow the protocol and do the boosters and, and things like that. So you need to review that with your vet again. Um, biosecurity. So finally, in our studies, um, nearly half the farmers that we talked to thought that they 
brought CODD onto their farm due to buying in sheep. That was the most common reason they thought. And there's been other sort of studies, again, indicating the importance of biosecurity and COD. So it's not just our work. Um, so currently, um, we'd recommend that any sheep sort of returning to the farm or, um, or, or purchase sheep um, should be isolated away from the main flock for four weeks, if at all possible. If you can't do it for four weeks, well, as long as you can. That's really the simple answer. When they're in, another annoying thing that we found is that not all sheep with cod are actually lame. So the only way to really know if you've got cod there is actually to check their feet. Um, because some of them sort of hide the symptoms and you can't tell. If you don't see any cod, I mean, we don't really have sort of strong evidence for this, but I think it's a good sort of general sort of hygiene advice. So if there's no cod in the sheep, I'd still consider like when they're in isolation, if, um, foot bathing, you know, ideally every week um, to just, you know, get rid of any sort of, you know, you know in incoming foot bacteria that perhaps you don't have on your farm. Um, if you do find cod, then I think really that's the point where you want to, you know, discuss that with your vet. And um, there may be an option of, of not having the sheep on your farm, maybe returning them. And um, if not, then I would suggest aggressive whole group treatment with antibiotics. So thorough treatment, making sure that everybody's sort of clinically cured before they return into the flock. And even then, we can't 100% guarantee that that won't, that'll stop it. It is possible that some sheep, we have found that some sheep after treatment still carry those bacteria. So, um, so we can't guarantee that that will stop the disease coming onto the farm. We often get asked of the risk between cattle and sheep um, and cold grazing. See, we haven't done any studies on that. It's something we we're hoping to do in the near future um, to see what the link is between, whether it is the identical bacteria between cattle and sheep. So I can't really give you any specific evidence-based advice on that. So that's me come to the end. Um, just sort of um, some take home messages. Um, COD is quite a challenging disease, as you know, it's a, a, an unpleasant disease. Um, so I would strongly advise that, you know, you work with your vet to come up with a control plan for, and treatment plan for your farm. Um, keep treating the foot with antibiotics until it's healed. So a single dose of, of long acting amoxicillin may well not be enough. So keep repeat treating the foot every you know couple of days until it's completely healed and dried up. Um, when we want to do a flock level control, control cod and foot rot together, fortunately there's an awful lot of overlap in the control measures, so that's not really going to be you know too much of a problem um, to do that. But hopefully now we understand that that is you know foot rot seems to be an important underlying damage to the foot that then develops into cod. And then if you haven't got cod on your farm, have a look at your biosecurity, you know, set up, see if there's anything you can do to tighten that to reduce the risk of the disease coming onto your farm. So um, where next for research? Um, we, we did a survey of vets and farmers, um, I think two summers ago, um, to, to, to identify research priorities. So we're currently um, working on, uh, on proposals to, to get funding for these. Um, so we're interested in looking at how long the pathogens survive on pasture, you know, so we can advise on, you know, how long to leave pastures empty for and things before reintroduction of sheep as a way of controlling transmission. As we mentioned a couple of times, what, what is the risk of spread between cattle and sheep? Always we can improve our treatment, so better treatment strategies and really the holy grail that, you know, everyone would like is, is really an effective vaccine and we're very keen um, to, to pursue that idea as well. So that's me come to the end of the presentation. Um, just to say thank you very much for listening and thank you very much to all the people that worked on COD um, um, that I've listed on the slide at the end. Um, so, and thank you. So over to you for questions, I think.
Oh, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, we've got quite a few questions rolling in. I just wanted to highlight um, to the listeners this evening that we do have a booklet, Reducing Lameness for Better Returns, uh, which covers all the basics, and that can be ordered in hard copy. And then we also had a previous webinar a few months ago, which you may be interested in, Managing Lameness in the Flock, uh, with our strategic farmer, Chris Elkington. And the webinar also covered some initial findings from um, research into foot bathing as well. So Jennifer, the first question is, um, can digital dermatitis, can dermatitis infected farmyard manure give cod to sheep? Um, that's, uh, um, I don't know, <laughs> sorry, that, that's the sort of survival thing, you know, that's where we need to look at how long the, the bacteria survive in, in the slurry and that's something we, we know we'd like to investigate unfortunately I, I'm afraid I, I can't give you an answer to that I'm sorry. Okay thank you yeah but it's hopefully coming in the future. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. Um, the next one is we've got a comment here that given that 1997 was the year when CODD was first noted um, but the bacteria associated with it are not new so has it just been there the whole time and not been identified or where has it come from please yeah so the, the sort of one of the main hypotheses is that it came from um digital dermatitis in cattle um and the those treponine bacteria are found there and i think that emerged in the sort of 1970s i think um in in italy and one of the the theories is is that the, the bacteria, the, the treponemes, um, may have adapted in some way, so they may have evolved so that they can um, survive in different environments. So, um, for example, it could be, say we don't know this, but it could be that you know that you do get a lot of treponeme bacteria found in the gut, and if some of those bacteria just mutated, you know, we've, we've heard about how things change and they mutate. Perhaps some of them evolved. Um, so that they could live outside the gut in an atmosphere with air, for example. So, so that, so we think it's probably, you know, a, a, a sort of mutation, a development of the the pathogenic bacteria. Say, it, it, it may have um, originally, um, you know, come from, from from cattle. So it might have evolved in that environment first. But that's all a bit of speculation at the moment. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, and the next one is, what are your views on antibiotic foot baths, please? Uh, we've been told not to use them, but this person finds it is the most effective way. And they've also commented that Draxin is also good. Yeah, so in terms of um, antibiotic foot baths, I mean, it really, yes, people have used them a lot in the past. And it really comes down to one, there's a couple of issues with it, which so aren't necessarily to do with your experience um you know i wouldn't dispute that you may well have found them effective and i've certainly you know spoken to farmers who found them effective it's really the, the the problem is is that we can't is that we can't recommend them and we shouldn't be using them because they're they're not licensed to be used that way in, in a food producing animal um, so one, it's you know like the, the sort of you know use of antibiotics in a food producing animal. They've not been licensed to be used that way. And then the other concern is um, you know disposal of that kind of volume of antibiotics into the environment, sort of affecting soil, affecting water courses. So um, that that uh, the other thing I have noticed, but say not you know maybe that's that's. Um, um you know not a problem that you see but i mean when we first started using cod we uh, um dealing with cod you were allowed to use antibiotic foot baths so we did try some then and what we found is that um because the feet were so sore and um, they didn't um put them in so they stood with their foot out so that that was an issue but really the main problem now is really with regards to you know food producing animals and licensing and 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 environmental concerns and also we don't um you know we don't have any data so i can't say to you well that's a good thing to do because i've not you know my job is to try and test things out so that we've got proper data that we can give you to say well we've tested that and this is the data we got for it um so you know so so that's kind of the antibiotic foot bathing thing 
Um, with Draxin, yep, so it, that's one of the sort of, you know, macrolide group of antibiotics that I mentioned. So, yeah, we found that to be effective um, in the laboratory. Um, I haven't used it specifically in the field, but th we have done some stuff with the same group of antibiotics. Um, so, yes, I would expect it. it's also a long acting product, so I would expect it to be effective. The reason that we don't um, kind of that we you know so so whatever your vet prescribes is kind of between you and them you know you have to decide between you and your vet what's the most appropriate treatment um, for your farm. I haven't got data on Draxin, so I can't present I can't share that because I've got it. So we've gone for the long acting amoxicillin. The reason we've gone for that is that kind of lower down the chain of important antibiotics for human health. So the kind of, you know, the sort of public health, the sort of human medicine people are kind of happier for us to use drugs like that in our food producing animals than they are to use the macrolides. But, you know, the really the prescribing um, is, is really a discussion between, between you and your vet and what's appropriate for your farm. But, it would make sense that they would work. <laughs> that long yeah, Thank you. <laughs> That's really helpful. Thank you. I'm just I'm moving on quick because we've got quite a lot um, to get through. But just on that subject of antibiotics, would it be wise to rotate antibiotics if a decrease in efficacy is noticed? So swap between, say, betamox for alamycin. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, we don't. It, alamycin didn't work very well in the lab, so it's not one we would we would recommend. Um, you know, in 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 wormers, we do cycle through antibiotics, and I think it gets or antihelmintics. I think it is a bit confusing. I know even the vet students get confused. Well, why are you saying one thing for antihelmintics and you're saying something completely different for antibiotics? And, and the, the, the sort of really the rationale with the antibiotics is more we want to keep away from the ones that they want to keep for human use. So we want to try and not use those so that they get preserved for human use as long as possible. So that's why, you know, really with us, we're kind of looking at the, 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 the sort of penicillin group. So, you know, like, you know, you could use sort of penicillin, that would work. But the reason we use long acting amoxicillin is because we didn't have a long acting penicillin at the time to use. So penicillin should be OK as well. So you could use that. But yeah, we haven't got any data on that. OK, brilliant. Thank you. And um, we've got a couple of questions about foot bathing. So you've mentioned, Jennifer, the various disinfectants that could kill the CODD bacteria. Is there any way you could foot bath with any of those? Um, we've had questions regarding the formalin, Vircon. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, and that's something um, I'm really keen to to do more on. We've done some small scale studies with um, with 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 foot bathing, um, which look quite promising. And um, so it's something you know we'd like. I haven't really got the sort of quality of data yet that I feel like I can sort of broadcast that. I don't think I can quite hang my hat on it yet. But I think Liz knows about some work that HDB have funded on foot bathing in sheep that maybe she can mention a little bit about that, Liz. Yeah, so we've got um, a PhD student, Hayley Marshall, who's doing a PhD on foot bathing in sheep. Um, she's been using glutaraldehyde for her study. Um, her results will be available um, later this year. So I think she's due to submit her thesis um, in December. So we should have um, results shortly after that. And um, we'll give you an update then. But I think um, what I would say from Hayley's research is that um, the bacteria seem to survive quite quickly. So after you foot bathed, a, a day later when you measure the bacteria on the feet, the, the bacterial load, it's almost as high as it was before you foot bathed. So it comes back really, really quickly. Um, her advice at the moment is that, um, I, I think the jury's out on foot bathing until she's finished her research, but her advice would be to foot bathe any lame sheep or those with COD or foot rot last so that you're not built you're making sure you don't pass infection from 
um, from your you know, affected sheep to your uninfected sheep. So I think that's probably a take home message for foot bathing. Um, in terms of which product um, to, to use, I'm, I'm not sure there's any recommended advice on which product is better than others um, at the moment. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, Thank I you, think ben. the ones I mentioned, sorry, just to avoid any confusion, I don't think any of those, yes, yeah, sorry, just to clarify, all those products we used were for sort of disinfecting hands and equipment. They weren't for feet, <laughs> so so don't stick. I I can I can I can um um from my own experience, I once accidentally sort of stabbed myself <laughs> when I was dealing with sheep's feet, and it was really quite nasty and environment. So I had some farm dirty next to me, so I stuck my hand in it to sort of disinfect it because I don't want deep sepsis here, and it really, really hurt. So I would not, re and it went quite nasty actually. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend using Burkon, farm dirty alcohol or antibacterial soap on sheep's feet but I'm sure it would make a terrible mess of them so if you are doing foot bathing just use the standard products that are sold for foot bathing sheep's feet um because uh, they're not they, these are all they're all surface disinfectants so you know they're you know think you know in surface disinfectants you know so what you really need um for foot bathing is like an antiseptic not a disinfectant so 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 Please don't use those. Please don't use them <laughs> for sheep's feet. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And just a final point on that one for clarification. Um, we know formalin is used. Would that help or hinder recovery um, with CODD, please? Yeah, again, I've never been anywhere near formalin with, with CODD. So I, 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 would, I, I wouldn't like to say, you know, um, I, I'm not not massive you know yeah so I, I so i couldn't say whether formalin would be um any good or not sorry okay thank you um and on the disinfecting side of things what would you advise as a practical way of disinfecting the foot shears and equipment between sheep and pens oh, please? well well that's quite simple so what what I would do is just have a sort of, you know, a bucket of um, sort of water with disinfectant in it, whatever, whichever one you use, um, and just have that next to you. So you can just like when you've handled the feet, you can just um, wash your hands, you know, in the, you know, or your gloves um, in there. And one of the biggest things with, which with all disinfection, actually, is that most of bacteria are actually removed by the cleaning step. So actually, if the cleaning is is more important than the actual disinfection, so if you sort of you know visibly remove dirt from your hands and then you know have them in the disinfectant, then that that should that should kill them. Okay, brilliant. So would you potentially advise maybe two buckets, one to get the dirt off and then a quick dip in the? No, no I don't think you need to. I think you'd be fine. In, yeah, it's fine just wiping them in the disinfectant solution. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, the next question here is if we have an outbreak of CODD, is there any thinking about how long you should keep the stock out of the field where you first found the problem? Unfortunately not. <laughs> I'm afraid that would be really, that's the sort of thing we would like to do, sort of survival studies in field situations. So that, that's something we'd be really interested in, but I'm, I'm not really able to give you an answer to that, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Would you recommend you perhaps treat it the same as we would for foot rot to be on the safe side, or um, we're not sure. Yeah, it's certainly, um, you know, you know, taking, you know, it certainly would be a start. You know, it would be, you know, a, a, a sensible precaution, and and it may be enough for cod as well. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. And the next one that around whole group treatment. Um, so if the sporting stock and CDD is present, are you suggesting antibiotic dosing for all? And if so, how many doses, please? Yeah, so yeah, so whole group treatments, that would be appropriate, say, you know, if you've if you know if you've got a large number of sheep in your own flock affected, then putting them into like a separate group and treating everyone as a as a you know as an infected group. Um, until they're all better, so that 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 would be fine. Or as I say, um, but so how many doses? You know, I'd I'd be thinking. You know, I'd be saying. You know, really at least two. 
you know, but potentially you might need more. It's really you, you, until it's kind of how long is a piece of skin, that's skin string. Um, so it's just really until the foot is dried up. Um, and then the other situation where that would be appropriate would be, you know, say from a sort of biosecurity point of view, um, you know, if you if you had something bought in stock, then yeah, treating everybody in the group, you know, whether they've got disease or they haven't, until the whole group is clear, yeah, because otherwise, if they're they're just going to sort of pass it from one to the next, aren't they? So, you know, that would definitely be a time for doing whole group treatments. Thank you. And have we had any research um, regarding using topical antibiotic sprays for CODD, please? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I have. I've done a little pilot study with that. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's quite small scale, um, and um, you know, it, it, it did seem to be sort of, you know, but it's not really sort of strong data. Just kind of small pilot study that we did. So, um, you know, it's probably. It, it seemed okay, you know, I, I, I can't really say what's it's better than the injecting. And, you know, what I often actually do is, is, is do both. So I think at the moment we're still really saying, you know, injectable antibiotics is, is the best option. Um, and But certainly, you know, doing injectable antibiotics and doing topical um, sort of antibiotic spray would, would also be um, a, a good idea because I think also that sort of killing from the inside and the outside and may also help prevent spread as well. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I think topical treatment would be good in combination with injectables. Okay, thank you. Um, a comment here that the advice is obviously not to trim. However, if the hoof is half falling off, just like a human when you catch a nail and it's painful, um, should we really be be trimming that hoof that's that's dangling off um, as it may become sore? I would struggle not to. <laughs> I would struggle not to chop that off. I, I'm sure we I'm sure we all would. Um, so yeah, but 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 don't say I said so. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I would um, think you know because you can't leave a sheep with half its foot hanging off. That's going to be really painful. So yeah, you have to use a bit a bit of, of, of common sense in this really. Yeah, so it's fine to. But like I said, you know, make sure you sort of disinfect your clippers and your hands in between so you don't spread it. But yes, I would do that. In all honesty. Thank you. Um, does hydrated lime spread around drinkers' feeders kill the treponemas? Um, again, I wouldn't. I, we didn't try that one, but I think it would seem like I would imagine there's a good chance it would. You know, they, they seem to be relatively sensitive to, um, you know, disinfectant. So I think, you know, you know, I, I can't say it definitely does, but I think there's a good chance. And also the thing with the hydrated lime, it sort of dries things up and it, it, it changes the pH. So generally that will, you know, deal with most bacteria. So I can't imagine why it wouldn't help with the, the treponemes as well, doing those two things. So yeah, that would seem a, a sensible thing to do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got a comment here, and I'm sure this person isn't alone, that they say they've been hit quite hard with CODD. Um, they've gone through every sheep's feet for the past couple of years, aggressively treated it multiple times and seen the sheep's feet have healed, but it still seems to come back after treatment and isolation. Um, is there anything else this person can do and why is it still spreading, please? Yeah, well, I, I think really in, in, that's the sort of case where you, you really need to sort of sit down with your vet, I think, and, and talk it through. You know, there are a number of antibiotics. There are, you know, different products and different regimes. Um, and really, you know, that that would be the time when you need to, you know, to sit down and say, you know, trying to sort of maybe isolate the group, looking at the whole control measures, you know, how much of a problem is foot rot, is, you know, are, is it worth considering, you know, doing some foot vax under, you know, as well, um, you know, so, so it's a bit like, you know, but with, 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 if you think about sort of COVID, you know, I talk to students about this quite a lot is that, you know, we, we have, we tackle it in a number of ways, don't we? We've got like the vaccine, we've got the social distancing, we've got the hand washing, you know, we've got, whatever else we do so often it's not just one thing that will sort it out so often it's not just the antibiotic you have to do the other things as well so looking at the risk factors on your farm what diseases you've got 
um, um, you know, and say whether, you know, starting a, a foot rot vaccination program would work, you know, whether sort of keeping everything, you know, in, in one group, treating the whole group rather than just individuals, and maybe when they're not releasing them, not remixing them until their feet have dried up, and then maybe sort of like, you know, you know, um, you know, disinfecting foot, you know, antiseptic foot bathing before they go out just to finally kill any external bacteria. Area. So it's sort of thing that really, you know, I'd, I'd say probably two heads are better than one on when when things are getting, you know, out of control like that because it is horrible, you know, and, it, and and like you say, probably really depressing as well. So I think um, getting a bit of, um, you know, professional support there would 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 hopefully, you know, help you sort of look at all the different tools you've got. You know, antibiotics is just one tool. We never sort out really any disease you know with just antibiotics you know if you look at mastitis and dairy cows you know yeah we use you know antibiotics for that but we use all the other measures too so that's probably maybe what needs to be thought about in that situation brilliant thank you that's really helpful um we've a question here on genetic resistance has there been any research done please similar to the work done um, on foot rot resistant merino sheep do we have anything for COPD? They, they haven't done it. It hasn't been done for CODD, but it has been done for foot rot. And there does seem to be sort of a, a genetic heritability. Um, I don't think it's linked to any particular breed, um, but they have found there is a heritable component to susceptibility to foot rot. You know, what that actually is, what changes in the foot actually make it more likely, I'm not very sure. But that's why. Um, you can sort of use um you know for you know you know the best sort of strategy you've got at the moment from a breeding point of view is is not breeding from sheep that that get sort of recurrent foot rot really or recurrent lameness issues that's really so you know if you are breeding sort of keeping records and not breeding from the ones that that, that get recurrent disease problems is is would be a a good way forward on that so that i think don't think there's any other more formal scheme than than, than doing it that way but yeah there is a fact there is some variability due to genetics going on for, for foot rot i think going back to the previous question as well that kind of links up a bit because i think um if you've got some farm data and you can track which individuals are recurrently getting um, CODD or foot rot, you can then cull on those criteria so you um, reduce the risk as well. So it might be that that, poor, uh, that farmer who's got issues with um, reoccurring uh, CODD, perhaps um, culling as well, um, based on farm data might be useful. Thank you, Liz. I'll just try and squeeze in two more questions and I think we better um, wrap up for this evening. Um, is it okay to treat a ewe close to lamin for CODD? It most definitely is. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes, you want to be treating your sheep. Definitely. She will much appreciate it. And yeah, and there's no problem with amoxicillin and um, pregnancy. So yeah, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and the final question for this evening, do you have any tips regarding giving four doses of the six mils um, into the muscle for less muscular sheep? It can cause a problem given that many doses. Do you have any tips um, regarding that? Yeah. So I, I think, um, no, I, you know, you know, I don't think many sheep in my, you know, in my should require four doses. I think, you know, maybe some might, but I think, you know, I don't think many sheep would require that many. So it would really be sort of rotating sites. So, um, you know, start with, you know, so generally, if if you can, sort of, you know, um, injections into the neck are sort of recommended in, into the neck muscles. And I think if you're um, not sure on the technique of that. There is a YouTube video, I think, of um, Chris Lewis doing it actually. Um, so, um, so into the neck muscle, and um, do one side, then do the other side, and then do um, say the sort of you know the quadriceps muscles, say at the the front of the leg, and um, so just above the knee, so like the you know the big quadriceps muscle there. Um, that that even in not very muscly sheep, that 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 you should be able to get an injection in there, and similarly on the other side. And again, if they're not very muscly, um, you don't want to be using um, 
um, like a, a big long needle, so potentially something that's just an inch long might be okay. Depends how thick the skin is, but maybe you might not need a big long needle, just an, an inch one. And also, what always helps is, um, you know, is, is if you use a, a clean needle every time, then that's going to much reduce the risk of any sort of, you know, bugs or anything getting in and sort of muscle damage caused. So again, you know, and also like if you've got any. When you pick up your antibiotics for the vet, just ask them. You know, that's that's that, that's what part of our job, you know, to advise on things like that. So so if you're in any doubt about something like that, just just ask them. But that's what I would do. Rotate sides, clean needles, um it would would hopefully um help with that. Oh brilliant, thank you very much. We have reached um our time limit for this evening. So I just want to say thank you for everybody at home um for excellent participation this evening and lots of Lots of questions. I'm sorry we haven't quite got through them all, but we've covered a lot of ground there, Jennifer. So thank you very much um, for your time this evening and Liz for joining us as well. Yeah, and just thank you very much to all you levy pairs out there for supporting our research. And you know, hopefully it's a mutually beneficial situation and we're 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 really grateful because um we're we're as bothered about it as you are, I think. <laughs> so thank you and thank you for coming along this evening. Thank you, Jennifer. And it looks like we've got plenty to look forward to in the coming years as well um, with what's to come with the research. That's brilliant. Uh, just a reminder that tonight's presentation and the questions have been recorded, so they will be available on the HTV Beef and Lamb YouTube channel with our previous webinars and videos should you want to catch up. Um, and there will be some relevant resources sent out in the follow up email as well. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you.